In this problem, we have a single kilogram of water undergoing a power cycle. So we have process one to two, where we have constant pressure heating. We have process two to three, which is constant volume cooling. Three to four is isothermal compression. And four to one is constant volume heating. We do have a few parameters such as pressure, temperature, and heat transfer given to us. We're asked to draw a PV diagram, label it with the pressure and volume with their proper units. We're also asked to fill out this table here, this chart here. And last but not least, we're looking for the thermal efficiency of this cycle. So whenever I have a power cycle or even a refrigeration cycle, and I just have multiple processes, like say three processes, or in this case, four processes, I like to create another table that just shows what all of my properties are at each state. Basically, this table is just going to take my, make my life a lot easier, and I'm just going to have an easier time tabulating what basically where I am on all of my states. So let's start filling what we have. So at P1, we have 10 bar. And then T1, we have 179.9 degrees Celsius. And T2 goes to 562.6, 562.6 degrees Celsius. And then we were told that process one to two was constant pressure heating. So therefore, we know that it's constant pressure, so P1 equals P2, so we have P2 equal to 10 bar. And then because it's constant pressure heating, note the word heating, not cooling, that means heat enters the system. And if you remember the sign convention for heat transfer, positive heat transfer means that it's entering the system, negative heat transfer means it's leaving the system. So here we have uh, process one to two, we're gonna have a positive sign just to indicate that this is positive heat transfer. We're also told that the water is a saturated vapor at state one, so that means that X1 is going to be equal to one. Now process two to three just says that we have constant volume cooling to P3 equals five bar. So at P3, we have five bar. And then basically whatever number we have in this box here is going to be equal to whatever we have in that box there. But since we can't fill them in right now, one other, one other thing that we can really take from this process is if you have constant volume, then you have no work. So because if you have, a, if you have no change in volume, then, then really no work is being done on or by that process. So we can zero out the work in process two to three. So we'll have zero kilojoules of work right here. And then in process three to four, we have isothermal uh, compression. So in this case, we have P T3 equals T4. We don't have either of those, but we'll find them later on. But we are told the heat transfer is negative 815.8 kilojoules. So three to four, we have negative 815.8 kilojoules. And of course, that means that it's leaving the system because it's a negative number. Finally, process four to one, we have constant volume heating, again, constant volume. So four to one is going to have no work here. And I'll, I'll show you why, uh, analytically, why that work turns out to be zero kilojoules when you have a constant volume process. But um, because it's, it's constant volume of V4 equal to V1, we don't have either of those right now. And at this point, it seems like we filled out everything they've given us from the processes. The only other thing I will say is that if you look at the cycle or the total uh, heat transfer work and change in internal energy in the first table, uh, you can always zero out that cycle change in internal energy here to a zero because the system is going to be in equilibrium. If you apply the first law of thermodynamics, you're always going to have that the heat transfer minus the work equals zero. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this table that I just made and try to fill in everything that I can because clearly to find the change in, or the delta U, I'll just simplify, say that the delta U, you do need to find each individual U or the uh, internal energy, right? And then to find the work, you can find the work if you find the volume. And from there, we can find the heat transfer in our, our cycle or our totals. And then we can find our, our thermal efficiency. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the properties at state one. So at state one, at one, we have P1 equals 10 bar. T1 equals 179.9 degrees Celsius and x1 equals 1. We can turn to a property table because what we're looking for from the property table is going to be the specific volume as well as the specific internal energy. So if we turn to table A3 and we move over to 10 bar, 
you'll actually see that our saturation temperature is 179.9, um, and then we were at X1 equals 1, so we're going to be using our saturated vapor properties for specific volume and saturated vapor for the internal energy, or specific internal energy. So now we have 1944M3 per kg for specific volume 1, and then we have 2583.6 kilojoules per kilogram for the specific internal energy. But notice that you're actually looking for the bulk form down here. You're not looking for it on a per unit mass basis. So in order to convert from your per unit mass basis into your bulk form, all you really have to do is multiply by the mass. So for example, to find the volume, you just have the specific volume times the mass, which would equal 0.1944 cubic meters per kilogram. Multiply that by your mass, and remember your mass was given as one kilogram of water. So multiply that by one kilogram. Kilograms are going to cancel out, and you're going to be left with V1. So let's we'll put a one subscript there. V1 equals 0 0.1944 cubic meters. So now we can fill that in. So we have 0 0.1944. And now if you notice, uh, because your mass is essentially just one kilogram, anything in the, in the uh, per unit mass basis that we find in the tables can just be straight up converted into the bulk form. So I'll just do this for completeness, but we have the U1 or the bulk form of the specific internal energy at one is going to be equal to the specific internal energy at one times the mass, which would be 25... 83.6 and that's kilojoules per kilogram and times the mass is one kilogram and now we can eliminate those kilograms and you're left with 2583.6 kilojoules for your internal energy at state one so we'll have 2583.6 so moving forward for the rest of the steps so for state two three and four when we find the specific volume or the specific internal energy, I'm just going to convert it into the bulk form afterwards, just because it's we have one kilogram in mass. Now, if it was two kilograms of mass, of course, it'd be double this number here and this number here. But for the sake of simplicity of this problem, we have one kilogram of mass, so it's automatically going to cancel out into the bulk form. So now at state two, let's find some more properties. So we have P2 equals 10 bar once again, and we have T2 equals 562.6 degrees Celsius. So we don't have a quality in this case, so we're gonna to have to find that out from our property table. So basically at 10 bar, you have a saturation temperature of 179.9 degrees Celsius, as we saw before. So if our temperature is anything higher than that number right there, then we're in the superheated region. And if we're anything less than 179.9, and of course fixed at 10 bar, which we are, then you're going to be in the compressed liquid region. Anything at 179.9 could be anywhere from X equals zero to X equals one or a two phase mixture. So in the case of 562.6 degrees Celsius, this is going to be, I'll just say X2 equals superheated SH. Although technically a quality always has to be a number from zero to one. This is just my way of configuring it. So it would technically be an undefined number, but I'm just going to write superheated in the table just so we know that. So because we're in the superheated region and we're at 10 bar, now we have to basically go to the superheated tables to pull our specific volume and our specific internal energy. So I'm going to turn to table A4. And if we turn to 10 bar, which is right over here, and we look for our temperatures. So we're at 562.6 degrees Celsius, but here we have the closest thing we really have is 540 degrees and 600 degrees. So we're going to have to use some linear interpolation and you know, your specific volume should be somewhere between 3729 and 4011, these two numbers right here. And then your internal energy should be, or your specific internal energy should be between these two numbers right over here. So from linear interpolation, what I found was that the specific volume at two so V2, which of course equals um, your bulk volume, if you multiply by the mass, equals 0 0.3835 cubic meters. And then similarly for my specific internal energy, which is just going to also equate to our total internal energy when multiplying by the mass, it's going to give me 3231.85 
and that's going to be in kilojoules. So now I'm going to populate that into my table. So we'll have 0 0.3835 and 32, 31.85. So now at state three, so we have P3 equals five bar. And you might think we have nothing else, but remember that P, uh, process two to three was constant volume. So therefore I'm, I'm gonna populate the table that V3 also equals 0 0.3835 cubic meters. So I'm going to say that our specific volume, which also equals our total volume, V3, equals 0 0.3835 cubic meters, but we divide by the mass, so we'll have it per kilogram. So with these two values, let's see where we are on the property table. So at table A3, we go to 5 bar, and we see where our saturated specific volumes are. So at saturated liquid, we're at point, or sorry, 1.0926 to the negative third, or 10 times 10 to the times 10 to the negative third, and then more importantly, at our saturated vapor, we have 0 0.3749, and because we're at 38.35, which is greater than the saturated vapor, therefore we're in the superheated region. So I'm going to say that X3 is also superheated. So I'll populate that into our table. And so now to find my temperature, my volume, and my internal energy, I'm going to be using the superheated table. So if we go to table A4, we have 5 bar. And then we were at um, 38.35 cubic meters per kilogram for our specific volume, which is actually going to be between the saturation temperature and 180 degrees Celsius. And of course, the saturation temperature is given right here as 151.86. So we're, our temperature is somewhere between 151.86 and 180 degrees. So when I interpolated, I found that T3 was just about 160 degrees Celsius. So I'll fill that in as 160 degrees Celsius. Next, I found that our internal energy, which should be between these two numbers right here, came out to be 2575.29 kilojoules. So we had 25.75 0.29 kilojoules. And our volume, of course, is just equal to our specific volume times our mass, which we already have as 0 0.3835 cubic meters. And now at four, we just have to use the relations from the processes. So four, we're told we have constant volume heating to P1 equals 10 bar and V4 equals V1. So we already have V1, so we have 0 0.1944 for state 4. And then we were told that process 3 to 4 was isothermal, so then T3 must equal T4. So we have 160 degrees for T4. So now with the temperature and the specific volume, I just want to see where I am at the vapor dome. I want to see if I'm in a two-phase mixture, if I'm superheated, or if I'm a cooled liquid. So I'm going to turn to the saturated temperature tables for water. So if we, if we go to 160 degrees Celsius and take a look at the saturated values for a specific volume, we have 1.102 times 10 to the negative third, and we have 0 0.3071 for the saturated vapor. The given specific volume was 1944.1944, which is going to be between these two numbers, so therefore we're somewhere in the two-phase mixture, so we're going to have to calculate where we are, what our quality is, I should say. So the formula to find our quality is going to be X4 equals specific volume 4 minus the saturated liquid specific volume divided by the saturated vapor specific volume minus, again, saturated liquid. So if we just replace these with numbers, we were given 0 0.1944 minus 0 0.001102. That's just the conversion of the saturated liquid 1.102 times 10 to the negative third. So we divide all of that 
by 0 0.3071 minus, once again, 0 0.001102. And of course, all the units here are in, are in uh, M3 per kg or cubic meters per kilogram. So everything is going to cancel out and you're going to just have a percentage. So you'll have the X4 equals 0 0.6317 or in other words, that's going to be 63.17%. This just means that 63.17% of this substance is going to be in the vapor state and the remainder is going to be in the liquid state. So now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to substitute these specific volumes with the specific internal energy and you'll have the X4 equals U4 minus UF divided by UG minus uf and if i rearrange for u4 i'm going to have that u4 or our target specific internal energy at state 4 equals uf plus x4 times ug minus uf now we can start substituting in with our values so at u4 we have uf and so for uf we have 674.86 so we have 674.86 plus our quality, which was again 0 0.6317 times UG, which is 2568.4. We have 2568.4 minus UF, which is 674.86. And if you plug this into your calculator, you'll have that U4 equals 1871, and that would be kilojoules per kilogram. So now if we just multiply the specific internal energy by the mass, we'll just have that U4 equals 1871 kilojoules. Now the last thing I want to do is fill in my pressure here. So if you recall from table A2, we were at 160 degrees Celsius and we're in the two-phase mixture, so therefore our pressure is going to be the saturation pressure, which is 6.178 bar. So now doing all this math and calculations just basically gave us all of our properties at every single state. So now that we have all this table completely filled out, now we can just go ahead and find all these values in the chart above. So for process 1 to 2, we have the change in internal energy from 1 to 2 equals U2 minus U1. And we have those calculated as 32, 31.85 minus 25. 83.6 and I calculated out that delta u12 equals 648 it's 48.25 kilojoules next we have our work from 1 to 2 so our work from 1 to 2 is going to be the integral from v1 to v2 pdv and when you evaluate this integral you're going to have the pressure times v2 minus v1 make sure you convert from bar to kilopascals to get your answer in kilojoules so you're going to have 1000 kilopascals times 0 0.3835 minus 0 0.1944 and therefore your work from 1 to 2 w12 equals 189.1 kilojoules Finally, we can apply the first law of thermodynamics. We have that delta U12 is equal to Q12 minus W12. And if we just plug in our numbers here, we're going to have that 648.25 equals Q12 minus 189.1. Solve for the heat transfer, and you'll have that Q12 equals 837.35 kilojoules. Next, for process 2 to 3, we're going to have that delta U23 is equal to U3 minus U2, which we had as 2575.29 minus 32, 31.85. And therefore, we have U23 equals negative 656.56 kilojoules.